That was uh, terrific and a great kickoff to, uh, to the discussions. A couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, silence your mobile phones. Uh, I haven't heard any phones ringing, so I think you're okay on that front. Uh, if you haven't found them yet, restrooms are located in the lower level lobby. Uh, the summit is providing voice translation into Mandarin. Uh, you can pick up a uh, headset in the lobby. Please do uh, return them before you leave. And check-in codes will be given at the end of each session. So students uh, you, who will need those check-in codes, you'll, get, uh, you'll have to enter these codes into the mobile app at the end of each session. All right, I want to move into artificial intelligence and its uh, perspective at, uh, in China's engineering and technology uh, frontier. Our next guest is uh, John Zhongan. He's the co-founder and chairman and CEO of Vimicro. Uh, he's got a lot of interesting roles. Uh, he's the, he, in addition to being the co-founder, the chairman and CEO of uh, vMicro, it's a technology surveillance firm, uh, he went to UC Berkeley where he had a master's in physics and economic management, a doctoral degree in uh, electrical engineering as well. After graduation, he worked as a researcher for several technology firms, including IBM, uh, he received the IBM Invention Award in 1999. He returned to Ch China to found uh, vMicro. There he developed the uh, Starlight Chinese chip, which saw a lot of success on international markets. He's earned many awards throughout his career, including the National First Class Award for Science and Technology. He's a member of the National Academy of Engineering in China, and he is a member of the National People's Congress. Uh, so he's got a lot of perspectives on this. He's uh, started a, he started his career in Silicon Valley. He's now an entrepreneur, a lawmaker, and an engineer in China. Uh, so let's have our conversation with uh, John Zhongan. I'll join you out here in a while. Thank you, Ali, for the lovely introduction on my first visit to George Washington University. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished member of U.S. National Academy of Engineering, the U.K. Royal Academy of Engineering, and the Chinese Academy of Engineering, the Grand Challenges scholars and students, good morning. It's an honor to be here, and it's a great honor to be with you, the best and the brightest from all over the world. I come from Beijing. It's a pretty city. Look at the sky. It's beautiful. <laughs> it might be different from what you're seeing from various uh, media reports of a big city that's suffering from heavy smoke, traffic jam, and other environmental problems. However, this is a recent photo of Beijing just before I come to this event. The sky is blue, the cloud is white, and Chang'an Street is beautiful. You might wonder what has happened. Look at this photo again. Look at those bicycles. Among various measures to curb air pollution, it is those bikes that make the difference. So please let me start it with a simple story about bicycles. 30 years ago, in the 1980s, China used to be famous for being the kingdom of the bicycles. At that time, bicycle was the primary way of transportation in China for most of Chinese. Each family has about two bicycles on average, with the total number of 670 million bicycles in the country. As China grows to become the second largest economy in the world, people turn to cars for commuting every day and stop using bicycles, which have been almost forgotten for many years. The total number of cars shoot up from 10 million to 190 million. However, can you imagine if 1.4 billion people use cars like bicycles in China, with two cars per family, how much pollution it will cause, and how much gasoline will it be consumed, and how much congestion will happen to our road. It can be a disaster. 
But I'm not here today to repeat the story of how bicycle use can reduce the number of cars, energy consumption, pollution, and congestion. I'm here to talk about this new breed of bikes. In China, we call, the, we call this shared bicycle on demand. It is so popular all over China that the market jumped from 2 million units in 2015 to 20 million units in 2016, and it can surge to 50 million by the end of this year. So it's a truly phenomenon. Here the question arises, to what extent are these bicycles different from those 30 years ago? And how are they different from those bikes parked outside here in Washington, D.C., with fixed docking stations along the street here. These bikes are of the same size, the same style, and they're either in yellow, in orange, or in blue, operated by different startup internet companies. Even more so, these bikes have new modern electronics installed which connects to the internet wirelessly, to GPS, to cloud computing, to database, to mobile payment system, to the central management platform that even collects big data and apply artificial intelligence. Look at this electronic lock. It is full of all kinds of high-tech stuff, silicon, software, battery, antenna, GPS, Bluetooth, mobile communication chipsets, it's a full-blown computing device. With plenty of bikes uh, parked around the corners of public facility, like subway stations, office buildings, shops, and parks, you just need to scan the barcode on the bike with your mobile phone and unlock the bike through the mobile internet pay system. Or you can locate the bike on the GPS by turning on the apps on your cell phone. Through the cell phone, the backend platform software quickly performs the custom authentication, authorization, and then unlock the bike. After you use it and finish, just park, lock the bike, and walk away. The backend system will automatically take care of the binning and updating the location of the bike for the next user to use. Unlike those in Washington, D.C. here, you don't have to find a bike at a fixed location or swipe the credit card. Or even better, you don't have to return the bike to a fixed docking station. It's much more convenient. Face, how much does it cost? It costs no more than one RMB yuan, or just 15 US cents for 30 minutes locating. It's much cheaper. All you need is a smartphone. So no wonder people say, two wheels are only a smartphone away. <laughs> Again, I'm not here to talk about the new IT applications. Instead, I want to tell you this is a new lifestyle through innovation. This is a new model to solve the problems for transportation in metropolitan cities, to save energy, to cut down emission, and to reduce pollution. In much the same way as the US-based Tesla reinventing electric cars, China is now reinventing the bicycles. We're not just reinventing wheels. We are reinventing two wheels. <laughs> oh, I forgot to mention. It also helped to solve the last mile problem for the people who want to use a public transportation. According to statistics, last year in 2016, the total distance traveled by those shared bicycles was over 2.5 billion kilometers, equivalent to a traveling between Earth and Moon 3,300 times. It saved 460 million gallons of gasoline, cutting down 4.5 billion micrograms emission of PM2.5, which caused smoke in Beijing, reducing CO2 emission by 540,000 tons. 
Furthermore, the shared bike on demand business model attracted huge amount of venture capital investments and entrepreneurship, and many startup companies were funded. It also created use for big data to allow the companies to apply artificial intelligence and cloud computing to identify more information about consumer behavior, credit history, traffic information, and other information for smart city developments. Several leading startups' valuation have been over one billion US dollars, like the US-based Uber and Airbnb. They become unicorns, very, very successful. But once again, I'm not here to talk about the valuations or big data. I'm here to talk about how engineering changes our world, how technology improves our life, and how innovation shapes our future. The success story of the bike sharing testified how problems can be solved through hardcore engineering. Like many other examples in history, challenges are equal to opportunities. The ground challenges are equal to ground opportunities. As engineers like you and me, once we are engaged, solutions to these challenges can be found must be created and implemented. That's why engineers will always probably play a leading role. Thank you. Enough about the bikes, but I, I want to emphasize about behind the shared bike phenomena, the important IT infrastructure built up in China that make this phenomenon possible. China, for many years, have invested billions of dollars in infrastructure and built the longest and largest fiber optic networks for communication through China's state-owned companies like China Mobile, China Telecom, and China Unicom. We are number one in the world for internet user base with over 730 million users, and the mobile internet users of 1.12 billion. We have 1.25 billion cell phone users and 700 million smartphone users. We also grow some of the largest software and platform companies, such as Chinese search engine Baidu, the largest e-commerce platform Alibaba, and the social media and WeChat giant Tencent. In hardware, we boast leading telecom equipment and cell phone manufacturer, like Huawei ZTE. Huawei now ranks number one in the international telecom market. Lenovo, by acquiring IBM PC and notebook division, becomes leader in the PC business. My company, V Micro Corporation, through innovation and hardcore engineering, we launched China's first silicon semiconductor camera chipsets in 2001 for the international leading brands in PC, notebook, and cell phone, and enabled internet video communication and photo sharing. And that paved the way for internet social network applications popular today. Last year, in 2016, V Micro just finished design and entered mass production of China's first deep learning artificial intelligence neural network processor unit chipset. In supercomputers, this year in 2017, China takes both number one and number two position out of top 10 supercomputers in the world. China now is the leading IT powerhouse worldwide. In addition to IT industry, China now is the second largest economy in the world. China has developed all sector industries, including power, chemical, medical, material, steel, construction, energy, and renewable energy. China has become the largest manufacturer of all kinds of industry and consumer products, and the number one exporting country in the world. 
our space program in the recent years are quickly catching up with world leaders with Chang'e rockets, Tiankong space stations, and Shenzhou spaceships, and Chang'e mission to land on the moon. In transportation, China has built world largest and longest highway system. More impressively, China has developed high-speed rail train technology and built the world's largest bullet train network. Today, it has 20,000 kilometers of rail lines, more than the rest of the world combined. It is planning to lay another 15,000 kilometers by 2025. Absolutely, this is another phenomenal success. Human talents are the most valuable asset in achieving such great success. For all the great achievements, we owe our gratitude to those engineers and scientists and technologists who made important contributions to China's development to become a modern country, as we say today. Among them, Dr. Chen Xuesen for aerospace science and technology, Dr. Deng Jiaxian, Chen Sanqiang, Yu Ming, Zhou Guanzhao for nuclear physics and technology, Hua Luogen for mathematics, Hou Debang for chemical industry, and Yuan Nongping for hybrid rice in agriculture. Some of them were trained in the US or UK and returned to China. For example, the MIT trained Dr. Chen Xuesen, who returned to China in the 1950s and built up a solid foundation for China's space program. In 2008, China Central Television Network named Dr. Chen Xuesen as one of the 11 most inspiring people in China. Indeed, he's such a powerful source of inspiration and imagination to many young people in engineering professions, including myself. In fact, great souls in history from science and technology and engineering worldwide, such as Newton, Einstein, Edison, Bayer, Steve Jobs, and even entrepreneur Bill Gates have always influenced and inspired generations of young professionals to aim high and go high, continue to create miracles for our civilization. One thing for sure is that the world will depend more and more on engineering achievements. For us, the smartest and the most ingenious people in the world, we are the chosen one. We are expected to follow their steps, and we will create the most advanced engineering in the world. And we will overcome the 14 grand challenges, and we will lead the mankind to a better world. Thank you. Distinguished Academy members, scholars, and students, we gather here today at this summit in Washington, D.C., not in Silicon Valley. Perhaps that's a reminder that we have to think beyond technology and engineering. Now I'd like to move on to collaboration. In order to overcome the grand challenges, only innovation is not enough, because many of our problems are system problems. We need to, a consortium of entities to come together and join effort. Other dimensions, such as public policy, law, international relations, sciences, social sciences, culture, and all humanity must be engaged if solutions to those challenges are to be created and implemented. The last century brought us unprecedented material wealth and standard of living. They have also undeniably lead to many new challenges, threatening our survival and continued development of the world as we know it. Specifically, the world's ever-growing population is depleting Earth's resources at a pace that cannot be sustained. The rapid exploitation and consumption of traditional energy sources, such as coal, oil, and gas, have undermined global energy security. 
on a global scale, the conventional development model characterized by widespread mass production, consumption, and waste lead to severe environmental problems and climate change. As President Dr. Dan Mo Jr. pointed out, in the 20th century, our challenges were primarily about things. But now, in the 21st century, our challenges are more about people, societies, and sustainability, quote unquote. We need to ask, how can a high quality of life and security be sustained and extended worldwide in this century? This is not a national question or a business question, but it is a question that concerns everyone on this planet. Today, thanks to the US organizer, we convened here to exchange ideas and try to find solutions to the 14 ground challenges for engineering, identified by a select group of experts of this committee in 2008. The idea of naming the specific problems to be addressed for global benefit caught on immediately and has been picked up speed ever since. Rarely has an idea captured the imagination of a profession, policymakers, and the general public as rapidly and forcefully as a ground challenge for engineering. The ground challenges are set forth as a way to inspire the engineering profession, young people, and the public at large to seek solutions. Although we come from different countries with distinctive cultural backgrounds, or even polarizing social and political system, yet we are all humans, living and breathing together on the same planet of seven billion people. We have more in common than differences, which needs to be emphasized over and over again. Any problem, when divided by seven billion, becomes minuscule, while any progress, when multiplied by seven billion, becomes a giant achievement. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm mostly impressed that currently we have a, such a group of most distinguished people from all over the world who are united in fighting the most challenging issue of our mankind in this century, which is climate change and global warming. In the face of this challenge, we go beyond the boundaries of interests, politics, and nationality, but fight together for a common goal. We carry the same understanding that we are in, all in this together. No one can stay out of this. We are united for our faith in science, our respect for truth, and our love of mankind. Over the years, I have come to believe once again that science has no borders. It's our common dream and common responsibility to make people lead decent lives in a healthy and safe environment. In the face of climate change, China is particularly valuable. We are a developing country with one-fifth of world population. In fact, we have a 200-year combined environmental problem that a developed country typically had, condensed into a short 30 years format. We don't have the luxury of time and space to become prosperous first and then solve these environmental problems later in such a sequence as did the developed countries. We need to act quickly. Ladies and gentlemen, to that end, Chinese government has proposed five major ideas of development. Innovation, coordination, green, opening up, and sharing. This proposal aims for a balanced, coordinated, and sustainable growth model, a departure from the model of massive production and consumption and waste. The Chinese government has also committed to the following timeline, reducing carbon dioxide emission per GDP by 60 
to 65% in 2030 from its level of 2005. In order to increase the non-fossil energy consumption to 20% of the total energy consumption, China has invested more than 100 billion US dollars in clean energy in 2015. According to the country's National Energy Administration, China aims to spend at least 360 billion US dollars on renewable energy by 2020. To curb the growth of greenhouse gas that contributes to the global warming, China installed an average of more than one wind turbine every hour of every day in 2015 and covered the equivalent of one football field every hour with solar panels. In this way, solar panel will be the main form of China's clean energy sector. Up to now, five of the top six global solar panel manufacturing companies are Chinese and in China. As a responsible citizen, I believe this is a noble undertaking. Environmental protection is not just tied to specific racial groups or nations. It is a universal issue affecting all citizens of the world. Although there are different voices and actions at this current stage, I believe all stakeholders will eventually come back to this position. Ladies and gentlemen, 17 years has passed since the dawn of this century. The ground challenge identified by the committee have come to surface one after the other, putting great pressure on us ever more so than before. They are like the sword of uh, Damocles dangling above us, urging engineers to speed up the power of innovation to work jointly in fighting solutions and ultimately to guard our precious Mother Earth. Above and beyond, in 10 years, in 20 years, in 50 years into this century, perhaps we might have new ground challenges coming at us, maybe the 15th or 16th ground challenges. So we need to stay vigilant and be prepared. The world is changing at an even faster speed, affecting all sectors of society and all works of life. It is inevitable that new and serious challenges may arise. For example, with the technology of artificial intelligence, AI, spearheading in such a momentum that's much beyond our expectation, they have already been worrisome predictions about human beings displaced by robots. While robots can potentially generate enormous goods and superb services for us at a lower cost, effectively improving our well-being, enriching our civilization, which is by all means great, it can also create massive unemployment, displacing arguably 50% of the workforce in developed countries and 80% in the developing countries, rendering people jobless without a paycheck. This is a century-old question regarding efficiency versus equality, but in an unprecedented scale. How do we prevent people affecting from losing out in this structure shift and suffer, suffering from a reduced standard of living? If we, if we may allow our imagination to run wide, would AI pose a threat to mankind? Would they rise up to work against us instead of working for us? Another question of uncertainty. What about genetic engineering in the future? That may allow new species or life forms to emerge. Or will it help develop medicine solutions for people to achieve longevity in this century? I'm throwing out these questions. Perhaps we may not have any answers to these questions. And we may not even know what the future challenges have in store for us. To some extent, Technology 
may cause new problems or new challenges. Or more broadly, the only certainty is the future that will be full of uncertainties. As a result, we must remain curious and stay engaged. Precisely, we need to encourage the next generation engineers or scholars to find problems, analyze problems, and solve problems. We need to maintain a positive attitude that from the previous industrial revolution, we faced the similar challenges, we adjust and adapt it, and never let doomsday same become a reality. To that extent that we fought the battles and won, we need to remain confident and optimistic that we will win in the future battles. As put forth in the power of an idea article, jointly written by the three presidents of the engineering academies, Dr. Mode of the US, Dr. Donning of the UK, Dr. Zhou Ji from China. The ground challenges are a call to action, and they have created a growing global grassroots movement that is changing how people think about the future and about the responsibility of engineering in creating that future, code and code. Indeed, this is a moment that breathes a new spirit, the spirit where empowers to face and to overcome all kinds of potential challenges in the future. This is a moment that involves new approaches for engineers to deal with uncertainties. This is a movement that advocates caring and commitment, meaning we care about the fate of our humans we care about the survival of our planet. We commit ourselves to the following, to the well-being of all mankind. This is our vision. This is our vision for the future. This is the vision for all humanity. This vision is power, the power of judgment and the power of will. It comes deep from the human heart and that is love, that is humanity. More than 2,000 years ago, Confucius, arguably the most influential and respected philosopher, said, Da dao zhi xing, tian xia wei gong. The greatest road is the one for all under heaven. Tian xia is literally translated as all under heaven. For today, Tian Xia, all under heaven, is a call for a community of common destiny for all mankind, based on which we seek out solutions to rise to the ground challenges with broad vision and global perspectives. For this interconnected world, Tian Xia, all under heaven, is a call for the sense of a joint responsibility to work together, to help each other, to share the burden, and to ride over crisis. For the future, Tian Xia, all under heaven, is a call for immediate action. We must innovate. We must coordinate. We must go green. We must open up. We must share with each other. Among the audience here today, there are many leading scientists and technologists and engineers. You are the best mind in this world. You live in an era that calls for a great sense of mission. You are the most capable people to solve the grand challenges for mankind. You have the ability to care for others, safeguard Earth, and build up a better future for the people. You can win the hearts and the minds by working for the betterment of all mankind. When we love what we do, we can contribute a great deal to the society. When we have a higher purpose, we will be empowered to awaken the deepest hope in our hearts. Ladies and gentlemen, my fellow engineers, all under heaven, we need you all. Let's roll up our sleeves and work hard with added energy. Let's roll.
Thank you. So in the, in the back room when we were talking, uh, you were saying to me that you didn't think your English was that good. That's one of the most inspirational speeches I've heard in a long time. So thank you for that. That was really, truly amazing. What a great job. Uh, I, I also uh, want to thank you for some new imagery uh, about the Sword of Damocles, because I think what you brought to us is relevance that in China, these challenges to the basic standard of living are very serious. Uh, I, I thought it was odd, given that you know so much about artificial intelligence, that you started with a bicycle. But not solving the bicycle issue is a standard of living challenge in, in China. So to take the, the power of engineering and apply it to something that seems very simple is, uh, is, is important. I, I will ask you this, though. <clears throat> is the you said something uh, a while ago about climate change being uh, a major challenge that we have to, f to face together. You're a lawmaker as well. In China, is there this tension between industry and uh, policy when it comes to climate change that there is in America? No. Actually, China, we ha have all concluded that you know, China is very vulnerable to pollution because a large industrial manufacturing base for the whole world. So the industry has challenges in reducing the carbon dioxide emission and pollutions and also save energies. And the Chinese government understand that for 1.4 billion people to share you know, the space, the air, and all those uh, standard of living for 1.4 billion, we are more vulnerable than any countries in the world. So the industry and our government and everybody, every Chinese, agree that this is our future. We have to go green. We have to go through innovation. We have to share everything, including the bicycles, the roads, and save energy, save pollution, and save congestions. So I started with this simple bicycle phenomena. It's a phenomena. It's going to be 50 million units, and you know, it's going to save so many problems from our city, from you know, saving gallons of, uh, billions of gallons of uh, gasoline. So it's just wonderful. And I know that the uh, US has a lot of uh, ways to uh, reduce the energy through some other means, mm -hmm. like electric cars and so on. And for China, we have to innovate for the uniqueness of own country. We have such a big population. Right. And because history. even electric cars are an issue for China because you've got an electricity uh, uh, generation. Coal, yeah. Uh, let, let me ask you, one of the things that <clears throat> is, is unique to Western democracies is that uh, many of our lawmakers tend to be lawyers. And in China, uh, engineering is actually a, a, a road into politics. Many of your leaders have been engineers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, China, over the last 30 years, China has uh, worked very hard with all the engineering achievements and so on. So it's quite uh, important for the engineers to play a bigger role in the society, and particularly in the lawmaking and in the direction of the country you know, when it's developed into the, such a large economy, there's a lot of things related to science, to, not, to technology, technology, and engineering. We have to make wise decisions. Do you feel that engineers get the respect they deserve in China? Oh, hugely. Engineers are considered as a very uh, proud job, and uh, young engineers particularly each year, we produce about 600,000 engineers from all the colleges and, and universities. 600,000? Yeah, a year. So we have a huge pool of talents uh, in engineering. And uh, China's uh, uh, employment rate is pretty high, particularly for engineering professionals. 
I'm going to ask if there are questions out there. We, have, we don't have too much time, but uh, I'm going to take some from the app. And if anybody needs the catch box, let me know. But let's start over here. Thank you very much. In the interest of full disclosure, I'm from the Colorado School of Mines. So you might understand where I'm coming from. I've studied very carefully the 14 grand challenges and listened to what you said today. All under heaven also includes the mineral mining industry that actually is required to make any of this happen. Um, we need innovation in the mining industry. And I want to just make sure that everybody who's in this room views mining as a major context for problem solving. Stewardship of Earth's resources is huge. So I wonder if uh, you have any comments about the importance of the mining industry, the extractive industry, beyond water and petroleum, and its importance in China. Um, I may not be able to answer all these uh, questions because I'm not, not very familiar with the uh, uh, minerals and the mining industry. Um, but I think it's important even today that with new modern technology or any uh, engineering efforts to help the productivity and particularly how to avoid pollution, you know, to go green with the mining industry, I think that's very important. All under heaven calls for such a mission, calls for such a everybody's involvement to go on green and to save energy to uh, reduce the pollution. I think that's very important. And in China, it's even more important because uh, China has a, a huge industry and a huge population relying on the minerals and uh, mining and energy, you know, coal, oil, and gas, and so on. So uh, as a, uh, China has been uh, working very hard on doing that, you, renewable technology for uh, power and for solar panels and for wind turbines and so on. So I think, in general, um, we just have to go green, all under heaven. We must take immediate actions. Right. Over there. One of the ideas that you spoke about was that we don't have the time to become prosperous and then sustainable. Do you attribute China's success in sustainability growth to the simultaneous growth of the economy and the sustainability, the sustainability industry? And do you think that represents a trend in developing countries in that as the economies expand, they will expand on a sustainability industry? Interesting question, thank you. Very outstanding question, yeah. yes. Um, I think China, you know, for several years that uh, We've been uh, concerned about the, as you saw on those uh, slides I present, with you know smoke, pollution, congestion, all that. I think now we realize we don't have the luxury to wait. We have to, at the same time, when we are developing our economy and industry and our cities and so on, we have to go green. We have to save energy. So China put a very ambitious goal and also ambitious target for the whole country to use in the future to utilize about 20% of non-fossil energy uh, in developing our already very large economy. At the same time, you know, we want to have uh, solar panels. You know, top five out of six uh, uh, solar panel manufacturers are in China. So over years, you're going to see China will become the largest solar panel uh, not only producer, but also the usage of the uh, a, solar I saw panels. a picture of a lake covered yeah, in solar panels in right, China. Right, right, right. Oh, there's a, uh, just a huge development. That's our commitment. We believe that without that, the developing it will be slowed down, and it will cause too much pollution for people to take care. And it's just a, uh, a way of... Uh, that's why we um, Chinese government has this five major ideas of development, innovation, you know, go green, coordinated, shared, and opening up. So that's important for any developing you know, economy to pay attention to the pollution, energy consumption. At the same time, they are designed to grow, to grow bigger and developing into a bigger economy. 
I got a question on the app here. Uh, you showed that picture of these engineers and you named a lot of them and I think it's so important to uh, honor uh, engineers who we, we don't recognize who have been responsible for things we do. But people have asked, how do you encourage women to become engineers because you had mostly men on that, uh, on that <laughs> slide. And I would argue that if somebody put that slide up in America, the similar thing might happen. So how do we get women to, how do we honor the women who are already doing the great work that we're doing, and how do we make sure that a slide like that in 10 years has at least half of it as women? <laughs> sure, yeah, women engineers are very, very critical because they have a different perspective from men. And we look at all the hardcore engineering, and a lot of time, we need uh, the whole humanity engaged to look all aspects of any development that we want to do. And I think women engineering uh, perspective will help to bring us uh, integral uh, perspective solutions to some tough problems. And in China, actually, the first Nobel Prize winner for uh, medicine is actually a woman. So, Tu uh, Yoyo, and we also have a lot of uh, great uh, scientists and technologists and engineers in, uh, you know, in, in, in our country's development uh, by women. So, uh, I think that uh, for American, that slice is not a, a good example, but, you know, believe in this history, you know, we've seen so many people devote their lives in engineering and take those grand challenges and realize our desire. And women is a major part of it. And we all work together, all under heaven. That's the way to go. Got it. Right over there. Hi. Um, so I am an engineering student at the University of Maryland. And you keep talking about how we have to work together as a team, Chinese students, Chinese engineers. And I've seen that the talent that you have in China for the young engineers is absolutely astronomical but I feel like there's a gap, and I don't know how I can make those connections with my Chinese counterparts and form that partnership going forward into the future. How do you see those connections being made, and what recommendations do you have for students like me who want to extend that olive branch to the students that are in China, and how can I form those connections? That's a great question. Yeah. Um, you know, myself, actually, is trained in the United States and returned to China, I found my first company, Pixum, in Silicon Valley. And then I found my second company, and then third company listed in China, listed in NASDAQ. I feel the world is smaller. So people work together, ideas get exchanged. It's called interconnected world. And I, you know, in ten, about 10 years ago, a lot of returnees from Silicon Valley back to China brought those ideas of internet, startup, entrepreneurship, and so on. And then these days, the venture capital business from Silicon Valley invest in China, like Uber, Airbnb, you know, uh, all internet companies start operating in China. And China also, the example I just gave about the shared bicycle on demand, they just hiring the first employee. They are looking for the first employee. Maybe one of you can apply in Washington, D.C. here. Just yesterday, I saw the news. So the world gets smaller, and uh, maybe there's a gap you know, between China and US and so on, but I see this gap is diminishing. And I think that you know, we're talking about the same business concept, same venture ideas, and same entrepreneurship spirit. And we even share the same financial markets and same consumer markets. So I think as engineers, as technologists, as scientists, there's no border. We just have to invent something, do something, and make it used by everybody. And that's how I did with my first ship you know, in uh, Pixum and acquired by Sony. Now it's in every iPhone. You know, Sony is delivering the CMOS image sensor technology based on the technology that they acquired from my company. Then I started my second company, and the chips were sold to Apple, Dell, HP, IBM, you know, Samsung, Sony, and so on. It's international, it's global. So there's no way actually to segment them. And, and your business, if no matter your engineer or technologist or business, you have to have a broader view and also a global perspective. 
Otherwise, the business or the entrepreneurship will be franchised into a smaller area and it will not be winning the economy scale also. So I think we have to open. We have to be open-minded. And I think the world is getting flatter and, and small and people work together. And for the grand challenges for this century for engineering, definitely there is a, a huge demand for every engineer on the earth to think grand challenges with grand view and grand perspective. I don't believe any gap there. And uh, you really have selected a profession which is about as global as they get. So uh, I agree with that. We're going to have to end on that fantastic note. We're, uh, we're out of time. Uh, but thank you so much for uh, a really remarkable inspirational speech and the idea that you've given us some real things to think about and for, to this last questioner's point, for helping us develop some of those connections. So thanks so much. An Zhang Zhan. Uh, it is time for us to take a break. I would ask, this has just been so great, and your questions are so amazing, and I'm sorry that we have not been able to get to all of them, but I would like you to continue that. But just so that we can keep on going with the schedule at the pace that we're going, I want to ask you, please, to be back in your seats by 11.05 a.m., please. So please uh, go out there, have some refreshments, uh, use the restrooms, and please be back in your seats by 11.05 a.m. Thank you.